Welcome into today's podcast. Interesting episode that I have planned for today and mostly going to be science-based. I am going to, I haven't done it in a couple of weeks, but I am going to talk about the NFL because the Super Bowl is coming up this upcoming weekend and I wanted to give my pick. I feel like I've been right throughout the majority of the season, so going to do a little victory dance. I did predict before the beginning of the season that the 49ers would win the Super Bowl, and so far, we're looking good. We're looking good, but that'll be later in the podcast. First couple of things that I have to talk about right off the bat, however, one, on our last podcast— I talked about the Apple Vision Pro and mostly a review of it, kind of seeing what it has done for other people. But since that podcast, I mean, it has absolutely exploded on social media, people using it for different things. One thing that I saw that was very cool is there's an ability to obviously, like I said in the last podcast, watch TV and watch um, movies and that kind of stuff. But I got to see a video that somebody did where they were watching NBA games where they had on one screen like a dashboard of all of the scores of the NBA games. And then in front of them, they had an NBA game that was actively playing. It was like the Hawks versus the Pacers or something like that. And they were able to make the screen as big as the entire room. And then on the other side, they had Twitter pulled up and they were following all the NBA news and that kind of stuff all in their living room, and then they just were like, oh, let me go grab a bite to eat, turned around, went into the kitchen, um, and then they could turn around and they could see in their living room what they had left over there. It's a really cool technology, and there was a video posted by Casey Neistat, a very famous YouTuber, uh, a vlogger. I mean, I, I don't really watch his videos on a consistent basis. I can't say that I really ever have seen more than probably five to 10 videos, but I do am very aware of kind of what he does. And one of the things that he said, I saw a Instagram video that he did um, where he went through New York and he was just walking through Times Square and showing you his perspective as he's walking around, you see buildings and places to eat, places to get uh, whatever kind of supplies that you are looking for, whether that's like groceries or if you're looking for a specific service you can look at these businesses and it'll tell you what's on the inside i think that was his video i might be wrong about that i did see a video of him sitting in central park almost getting emotional because he was uh seeing this entire world around him and the point that he made was this is going to be the worst version of this technology which is a hundred percent true and i think is important when we talk about these technologies such as the Apple Vision Pro. The current iteration of it in the current form of the Apple Vision Pro is going to be the worst model that Apple puts out, right? Because over time, unless there is some unforeseen issue, this is going to be the worst Apple Vision Pro model that they put out. They'll put out an Apple Vision Pro 2 and a 3 and a 4 and a 5, so on and so forth. And with each one, hopefully it will get better. And hopefully the the only thing that I thought was, okay, we got to get rid of the the cable coming out of it that goes into a basically a battery pack that's like that big. I just think it looks gross and it looks ugly. Other than that, it looks crazy, crazy, crazy. People have been removing the glass on it, taking it apart and going that the insides, testing the durability of the glass. A lot of really, really cool stuff. So. Um, make sure you go watch all of the people's video, Casey and I that make sure you watch Marcus Brown Lee. He did a, um, a really good, uh, deep dive on it. I have not watched the entire video. I've only seen clips of it. Um, but when it comes to technology and reviews and that kind of stuff, he's definitely the best. And, uh, if you're on Instagram or any social media, TikTok or whatever, go watch videos of what people are using this headset device device for because there are apps that you can download that you can use with it it's not just um it's not just like four or five apple apps that you can use no you can download specific apps 
from the app store that work with your Apple Vision Pro. So cooking, whatever it, it may be, there's apps that are coming out for this device. So it's a very, very cool and very, very interesting start to this brand new technology. But that's not what I wanted to talk about on today's show. On today's show, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, something that I also saw on Instagram about plants, plants being able to communicate. And this is something that if we go back, I mean, almost a year and a half ago, I want to say, I I talked about on this show, um, Paul Saladino, and I've talked about him probably multiple times in the past. Uh, and I've done a pretty much a 180 shift on him because there are other people that I follow who have exposed his viewpoint as being myopic and being very close minded. Uh, but one of the things that he has said is that there are these defense chemicals that are released by plants. And by doing so, they can harm the person who is ingesting them. And it's a defense mechanism so that they can survive longer, which makes sense. However, I was kind of just taking his word for it and kind of just like, okay. And then with more new evidence, and I've posted about this stuff on my Instagram of people debunking him. Um, but there has been more evidence that has come out now that says basically, and we'll see right here, that these plants are – by way of chemicals, able to interact and communicate with each other and basically create a network among itself for things such as saying, hey, they're cutting us down today. Hey, there's bugs here. Hey, we have these organisms that are trying to eat us. We need to conserve more water because it's not raining as much. So there's too much sun out. So we really need to start growing. Like this communication network between the plants and the plants it's very very cool and i want to get into this study so without further ado let's hop in it i i am very very interested um to get into this story particularly because i think it's important i think it's important to understand the way that this particular planet works because this kind of communication that is done between these organisms is something that since the 1980s has been hypothesized and there has been some evidence for, but now I think we can apply this sort of communication between plants and apply that to, say, a different civilization, say, life outside of Earth. Maybe there is some kind of organism that's on the moons of Jupiter that is able to communicate with each other and uh, interact with each other in a different life form than we would be accustomed to here on Earth. So I think this is a very interesting thing, but let me stop talking. Let's get into this particular uh, article. Let me start off with um, a video, just kind of overviewing the thing. It's only three minutes. I'll probably get copyright strike, but that's okay. As it's saying, Japanese scientists recorded plants talking to each other, communicating. From Satima University, I think we've talked about it. This university in the past, uh, they're doing some good stuff over there in Japan. Scientists say plants use fine mist of airborne compounds to talk. We'll get we'll get we'll get more into this later, but let's just watch the video. Study demonstrates how plants assess and release air compounds. These airborne compounds, similar to smells, 
form a fine mist. And that serves as the communication with the plant. So they're sending this mist of these basically chemicals, spreading it around, and that's what they're using to communicate to other plants. Scientists observed an undamaged plant responding to a damaged one. can detect organic compounds from damage one. Basically saying, yo, somebody took a bite out of me. Uh, I need help. This triggers defense mechanisms to protect themselves from threats. Now, how do they do that? Scientists connected an air pump to a container with leaves. I'm liking this mood music. Hopefully, in the YouTube the container also had caterpillars feeding on plant leaves, munching away. Uh, plants damaged by caterpillars found talking to undamaged plants. Basically, being like, yo, there's a caterpillar that's eating me. You gotta, you gotta get out of here. I assume. Biosensor installed revealed undamaged plants receiving messages. Cancer plants reportedly send danger cues to undamaged ones. Interesting. Interesting. All right, now let's get into this article. So as we saw in the video, a team of Japanese researchers made a groundbreaking discovery capturing real-time footage of plants transmitting defense responses to their neighbors. So the study... Our last story tonight is about a superpower. All right. The study's breakthrough lies in observing undamaged plants responding to volatile organic compounds emitted by other plants experiencing mechanical damage or insect attacks. And the insect attacks is what we saw in the video then here's a quote plants perceive volatile organic compounds released by mechanically or herbivore damaged neighboring plants and induce various defense responses such interplant communication protects plants from environmental threats the authors explained now the thing is how they are doing this obviously we saw in the video they're doing this through a mist but Let's learn a little bit more. The experimental setup included an air pump contain connected to a container of leaves and caterpillars in another chamber housing Arabidopsis thaliana, a common weed from the mustard family. The Arabidopsis plant were genetically engineered to fluoresce green upon detecting calcium ions, which act as stress manager so they basically created a plant where uh they were able to see basically how it was communicating which is very cool so they had hypothesized that they are communicating we'll get into it further that we've kind of had an idea that plants are able to communicate with each other since the 80s that's what i said when we started um but in this exact uh study they actually went through and created a plant where they could detect how it was communicating to the other plants around it. Using a fluorescent microscope, the team could monitor the signals released by the undamaged plants after they received VOCs from the damaged plants. All right, and here we go coming up next. This study builds on initial observations of plant communications documented in 1983 which sparked significant discussion within the scientific community. Quote, we have finally unveiled the intricate story of when, where, and how plants respond to airborne warning message from their threatened neighbors. He emphasized the crucial role of this unseen communication network in alerting neighboring plants to imminent threats in a timely manner. In summary, Toyota's research shines a spotlight on the complex and subtle interactions with the plant kingdom. 
within the plant kingdom while broadening our understanding of ecological relationships and plant defense mechanisms. So you have a plant that's being eaten, and it sends out these VOCs, as we look up here, volatile organic compounds that are emitted by other plants experiencing damage or attacks. So they're sending out these signals to the other plants, and like in the video, we saw it as kind of a mist. But it's these chemicals that land on the other plant, and then they're able to somehow – decode that information and know that there are other plants in the area that are under distress under duress and then as a result they're able to take preventative measures to help save themselves now what that is we have to figure that out as discussed above the world of plant communication is a realm where chemical signals light messaging electrical impulses and networked Roots create a complex language that is crucial for plant survival and interaction. Uh, there was somebody on the Joe Rogan experience, I think Paul Stamets, who talked about the largest organism on the face of the earth is actually a mushroom. And what happens is this mushroom on the surface is just the little caps that you know, but underneath the ground, the roots of these mushrooms, and this is spanning thousands of feet thousands of feet and it takes up basically square miles is how big this actually becomes and gets and through the roots they're all different parts of the mushroom are able to interact with each other shift and share resources along different parts of the roots so this is something that we've had some knowledge of um, but we do not have direct evidence like we do now with this particular study. And I think it's interesting because I have plants in this room right here, and I've had plants that have died. I have plants that I have forgotten to water for maybe a week or two, and then they start to die a little bit. What signals are being passed along from plant to plant? I have an aloe plant, and I have a basil plant among other plants, but those are the only two that I know the name of. If one of those plants is being eaten by, say, a fly or a caterpillar gets inside and it starts eating it, is that able to send out a signal to a different type of plant? Or is there a language barrier between the different plants? I don't know. And I don't know if that's something that was answered in this study either. I do have the full study that we will uh, – briefly touch on but it's it's a lot of uh, jargon that i do not understand and i'm not qualified uh to to speak on but is there a certain language like say basil speaks spanish and aloe plants speak french is that kind of what it's like or is there an ability that if a basil plant is somehow being harmed by any which way uh, is it able to send a signal over to a different type of plant even if its roots are not connected i'm not sure at the heart of plant communication lies the use of chemical signals as discussed previously in this article plants release a, vi a variety of volatile organic compounds into the air that mist that we saw voc serves as messages to neighboring plants they can convey information about environmental conditions such as drought or pest attacks for example when a plant is attacked by herbivores it emits specific vocs that can be detected by nearby plants so this is leading me to believe that in our aloe and basil example we would have the ability for one plant say an aloe plant which um, I have taken a piece from because I um, got a really bad sunburn when I was in the Dominican Republic and my my back was all dry and itchy and I had something that's known as the devil's itch or hell's itch, which was one of the worst experiences of my life. Definitely do not recommend you to uh, not reapply your sunscreen. Uh, just flat out just stay out of the sun if you are of a similar complexion to myself. It's just 
sometimes not worth it. But I took a piece of the aloe from our aloe plant. Now, when I did that, could there have been a possibility that the aloe plant sent out a signal to the surrounding plants? We have multiple plants right along here. I know it's hard with the sunlight coming right there to be able to see it, but we have other plants on that side of our apartment and over there as well. When I took out that aloe, did the plant send a signal to the basil saying, yo, watch out, there's somebody around here hurting me or say like what does it actually say i guess we'll have to figure that out these neighboring plants upon receiving the signal may then bolster their own chemical defenses in anticipation of a similar attack so in our example maybe the basil is conserving resources conserving its water because it knows at one point it might have to fend off some kind of being or some kind of whatever it may be from trying to eat it interesting 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 one of the most fascinating aspects of plant communication is the transmission of alarm signals when a plant suffers physical damage it releases vocs that signal distress this not only alerts neighboring plants here we go to potential dangers but also attracts natural pests natural predators of the pests harming the plant that's interesting so if you have a plant in which the say in our basil and uh, aloe plant let's say there's a caterpillar that's eating all of our basil that basil plant can send out a signal to spite i don't know what the natural predator of a caterpillar is i'm not sure but it can send out a signal to the natural predator of that exact um thing that is eating it that is harming the plant to have them come find it out so it's basically calling in reinforcements crazy stuff and then how is that natural predator of whatever is eating it how does how do they receive these messages very very crazy crazy stuff Yes, and then it says, in essence, plants can call for help recruiting allies in their fight for survival. Very interesting. And I mean, this probably is tenfold when you have uh, plants that are connected via the roots, and they're all one type of plant that's kind of in a garden. And say you have deers that are eating it in the garden, they'll communicate to each other, be like, hey, we need more resources. I got I got 50% of myself being eaten over here. I need to regrow this. Uh, so can you give me some extra water? Can you give me some extra nutrients? Send them over this way. Very cool. Plant also communicate through electrical signals, a method reminiscent of the nervous system in animals. When a plant is stressed or damaged, it generates electrical impulses that travel through its structures. These signals can prompt physiological changes in the plant such as closing stromata to prevent water loss during drought conditions. So in our apartment, that's probably happening very frequently because uh, I tend to forget to water them for maybe two, three weeks. I, I've gone a month or two without watering them. And luckily we have plants that are able to survive without having water every day. But I would imagine that they're able to communicate to each other be like yo this guy's not giving us any water i guess we just gotta conserve for a little bit and luckily they have enough sunlight in certain areas of the house so they're able to survive long enough uh, but we have had some perish which is unfortunate but i just am not on top of the watering beneath the soil Plants engage in a complex form of communication through their roots and associated fungal networks, often termed the wood wide web. This network is primarily focused by mycorrhizae fungi, which connects the roots of different plants. Through these connections, plants can share nutrients, water, and information. For instance, a plant experiencing nutrient deficiency can receive supplies from a neighboring plant throughout this underground network. 
This symbiotic relationship not only facilitates communication, but also fosters a supportive plant community. Okay, understanding plant communication is crucial for appreciating the dynamics of ecosystems. It, ex it helps explain how plant communities respond to environmental challenges. In summary, boo, boo, boo. All right, now let's go to the actual study. So here is the study. You see all the authors right here. I'll post this down in the description. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to really read too much of it, uh, but you can kind of see right here. This is a image of um, – here, here. Now that we know what VOCs are. So it'll go from air pump, flow meter, goes into here. This sends out the VOCs that it's damaged, sends out signals to this uh, receiver and this little dish, this little um, plant right there, and they're able to detect that. And you can see right here, if you look at L1 on this top row, this first frame is zero seconds. Second frame is... Is this 600 seconds? What's that? Six minutes? I don't know. Um, And then this other one, 1,200. Is that 12 minutes? Not doing the best at math right now. But anyways, this shows you um the lighting up. If you look at this top part, you can see where this arrow was pointed, this yellow arrow. You can see that in the first the first slide, there is no light on that top portion of the plant right there. And then after 600, we'll say seconds, it's lit up. And then add another 600 seconds, and now it's even more lit up. And you can do the same for the different extremities of this particular plant. You look at the bottom right here pretty dark then in the next one it gets a little brighter and then in the next one it gets a little brighter same thing for this one over here on the right this one is the most difference probably of any of these you see right there it's almost completely dark the same color as the background almost then it gets a little bit more green and then it gets even more green where it looks like it's glowing and then same thing here for the bottom and I do assume that these are seconds because I don't know how fast the communication is going to be, whether that's inside the plant itself, sending signals from, say, the tip of the plant is being eaten. How long does it take for it to send a signal? Oh, crap, I'm getting eaten by a caterpillar up here. I need extra resources. We got to reach out to all of our people to let them know that I'm in danger. How long does that take? It looks maybe it could be 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, which is interesting to think about. I wonder if it could be faster, if it could be slower. Does it depend on the type of plant, where it's from, whether it's communicating through the mist, as we saw, or if it's communicating through the roots? Which way is actually faster? And we'll continue right here you can see more images of the actual lighting up of the plants a lot more stuff right here more stuff right here this is really cool because you can actually see um the the signals going through the plant which is really cool to see a um, whole bunch of mumbo jumbo a lot of graphs and stuff that I cannot figure out. Interesting, interesting stuff. Now, let's take this idea of plants being able to communicate and look outwards. I've talked about many times on the podcast about Europa, which outside of Earth appears to be the best place for life in our solar system. It's very cold. However, under its surface, because of the core of that particular moon, it is warm enough, theoretically, to have liquid water under the surface. 
It's a layer of ice, about a couple of miles thick. It's pretty thick ice, but then underneath that, there is what they believe is liquid water. And they're able to see that because there are some vents that go through the surface and we're able to detect and look at what is in those gusts of water or those geysers and see what the contents of that are. Now, this type of communication between plants is something that since the 80s, we have kind of known about is the word that I'll use. Is there a different type of communication? And I've talked about this before, but is there a type of communication where, say, a different civilization is trying to get in contact with us? Last episode, I talked about Oumuamua, the asteroid that came from outside of our solar system and passed by Earth. Was that a signal? Was that a sign? Was that some form of communication from a different civilization, possibly millions or billions of years ago, letting us know about something, and we just don't have the capability of interpreting that message? How likely is that scenario? A scenario where we are being constantly bombarded with messages of stay safe this is about to happen be careful of this do not fight in wars do not do not do all of these horrible things that us humans on this planet are capable and quite often doing are those signals being sent out and if so are we able to interpret them are we able to listen to them and are we able to react to them because the signals that we're sending out, we've been sending out radio signals and, and different kind of um, forms of electromag electromagnetic radiation out into the universe in order to connect with other civilizations. Are we on the wrong frequency? Are we not communicating in a way that can be observed and can be understood by other civilizations? Not every world out there is going to speak English. Perhaps no planet out there speaks English. No planet out there speaks any of the languages that we here on Earth speak. And that creates a whole list of problems as well. We don't have this network of plants where all the plants share this common knowledge of a particular language. Like I said with the basil and the aloe, does one speak Spanish and one speak French? It appears not. But in the case of humans... It appears that we might be speaking French and the aliens are speaking Spanish. And I don't know. I do hope that doing more research on this and kind of understanding, one, how the root system works, how they're able to communicate through the roots of their entire colony to say, all right, I need more resources on this particular plant because of droughts and this particular plant because of animals that are fighting them also through the physiological processes where they have something eating it and it sends an electrical signal to another piece of the plant to make them aware and then we obviously have the mist that is basically being emitted by these uh, plants which is also used to communicate as well could these very same things be applied to us humans with far out civilizations i think it's likely obviously the roots one wouldn't work but is there a certain kind of mist that we could spread out through the universe that could be understood that could be encoded that could be interpreted by a different civilization i sure hope so and i know one of the things that i talk about very basically every single episode on this podcast and the reason why i do is because i think it's important and i genuinely think about this question every single day is are we alone and if we're not alone what if we're sending out the wrong message what if they're receiving the messages but they don't know what they say and there's wisdom that these other civilizations that are say even a thousand years more advanced than us want to be able to help us out as a civilization, but they can't because they can't see what we're saying 
or we can't see what they're saying. I don't know. Maybe one day we'll be able to have the plants of our civilization connect to the plants of another. And through that process, those plants could talk to each other. Say there's a aloe plant here on Earth. Could there potentially be another aloe plant on a different planet? I don't see why not. Could they potentially, if close enough, interact with each other and then us as two different civilizations encode those messages in our own language? Would then we be able to send messages between plants and communicate through that way? I'm not sure. I don't think Google Translate is going to help anybody. All right, moving on to our next story. I don't know. I, I, I feel like I talk about a lot of the same things, which is probably not the, the most interesting thing, but I talk about things that I have some knowledge of and I have some passion for. So... I wanted to talk about kind of nuclear fusion, and I know I've talked about it. Obviously, that's how our sun works. That's how all stars work by nuclear fusion, turning hydrogen into helium, helium into blah, and that into blah, and blah, and so on and so forth until they get to a point where they can't continue uh, fusing these atoms into different elements. And... This is almost two years ago now, but this is December 2022. There was a quote-unquote breakthrough in nuclear fusion. Um, and now since that point, there has been a lot of progress made with nuclear fusion. And ultimately, kind of the way in which that it is kind of defined as a little interesting because it wasn't exactly fusion because the amount of energy that they put in versus what was returned was actually less than. So say they were using 500 units of power to power up this thing through nuclear fusion. They only got 250 units of power. So it was, they were putting more in, they were actually losing energy, but there was still fusion taking place. So We'll talk a little bit about kind of a new breakthrough. I do have another video. Um, might just get the whole thing. I'm not even monetized, so it doesn't matter, but might get all the copyright strikes. But I think it's just important to have these conversations and to have people who are more qualified than myself speak about these topics, and then I can chime in and give my take and my analysis of what's going on. First time scientists have produced a nuclear fusion reaction that created more energy than was expended. A breakthrough to tap. You heard that right off the bat that created more energy than was expanded. That's the big difference. Into the same kind of energy that powers the sun and the stars. Researchers at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California announced the details today, and it could have huge implications for potentially creating clean and limitless energy someday. But that day is many years away. To help us understand what was achieved and what still needs to happen, I'm joined by our science correspondent, Miles O'Brien. So hello, Miles. Remind us, what is fusion? What is nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion is what powers the stars, what powers our sun. Essentially what happens is a couple of hydrogen atoms come together and they fuse. And when they fuse, uh, they create a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, this happens on the sun under tremendously uh, rigorous conditions with a lot of gravity and force. Uh, it's very difficult to replicate that here on Earth. And, and what exactly is the breakthrough that these scientists achieved? As you said, it happened at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the National Ignition Facility. It's the most powerful laser in the world. Keep that in mind. They're using a laser to actually go through this process, which is important to know. 
192 lasers pointed at something about the size of a peppercorn inside a cylinder. The energy which was delivered to that cylinder was on the order of two megajoules. Now, just for a point of reference, uh, one kilowatt hour equates to 3.6 megajoules. So in any case, two megajoules came in. It ignited those hydrogen atoms. They fused and created more energy, uh, essentially one megajoule more. Now, that is the first time that's ever happened in a laboratory experiment. Obviously, it's not to scale. There's a lot of work to be done, but it's a moment to remember. Well, how you said a lot of work to be done. And so how far are we from taking this breakthrough and turning it into something that can be scaled and used uh, for commercial purposes? Well, just to give you a, a point of reference here, they're able to do this you know, once a day. They need to be able to do this 10 times a second in order for there to be enough electricity to be practical and scalable and something you want to plug into the grid. So you, you get an idea that it's many orders of magnitude away from that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to improve the uh, technologies that are involved in these lasers, among other things. Uh, but that said, there's a lot of focus on fusion right now, particularly in the context of the climate emergency. The Biden administration has a decadal effort to accelerate the efforts in this realm. Uh, let's listen to the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. If we can advance fusion energy, we could use it to produce clean electricity, uh, transportation fuels, power heavy industry, so much more. It would be like adding um, a power drill to our toolbox in building this clean energy economy. It's a nice drill, but we're still a little bit away, Judy. I just want to make sure we temper the excitement a little bit. Um, and, and thank you for that, because it's easy to get our hopes up. So, Miles, give us uh, the, a little bit of the history of this project. You were telling us that originally this was all about nuclear weapons. Yeah, this the National Ignition Facility is all about kind of creating the circumstances inside a hydrogen bomb. Uh, this was created after uh, uh, the U.S. agreed to stop underground testing of nuclear weapons in the mid-90s. So in order to make the stockpile stay safe, and to ensure they can develop uh, weapons in the future, they had to figure out ways to test. And so that's what this was built for. It was never built with the idea of creating uh, commercialized energy, but along the way, they discovered it can be done, although it is a very complex way to do it. And Miles, you were telling us that there, or reminding us that there are other uh, experiments out there involving uh, nuclear fusion. I explain what the difference is between what what that has been, what that is, and this. Well, uh, this one, which is designed to help bomb makers do their job, and we get some energy out of it. The other idea, which was uh, thought of initially as a, a way to produce civilian electricity, is called a tokamak, which is a giant racetrack, donut-style racetrack with magnets, huge facilities. This is the other way that they've done it as well with magnets where they're taking this obviously magnetized thing and circling it around. And there are videos that you can see of this online, and it basically turns into plasma, and it looks really cool. But once again, the issue is you're putting more energy than what you're getting out. You're supposed to fuse these elements together, and the fusion creates a massive – a release of energy, much more so than fission, which is what we currently do in our nuclear reactors right now, where we're breaking apart atoms. And the breaking apart of these atoms releases that energy outwards, whereas this, we're trying to combine atoms and the combination, boom, they come together. Hydrogen comes, forms into helium, boom, a bunch of energy is released. And so with the magnets, they have not had as, as much success. Uh, which create the uh, circumstances where you can fuse these atoms in a very different way. And there's different. half a dozen or so of these projects all around the world, public and private, and uh, they are making steady progress, but this is tough. Um, and despite all the talk today about the U.S. being leaders in all of this, uh, the, uh, there are other nations which are kind of driving the bus on this. I spoke with the president of Fusion Power Associates, 
Steve Dean, who's been in this business for 60 years. He's sort of seen him come and he's seen him go. Listen to what he has to say. So most of the money and most of the effort is not here, in spite of how we all think of ourselves as always being in the lead and everything. The Chinese are way ahead of us. The, the UK is way ahead of us. <laughs> and Japan is right in the mix. So all you hear about in the US is US, 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 but the, really the, the momentum for fusion right now is overseas. That said, there are more than 30 private fusion companies in the world, and most of them are in the U.S. There's about a $2.5 billion investment there. Meanwhile, the government is spending about a billion dollars a year to advance this technology. But, Judy, I should remind you, the old joke among physics, physicists is fusion is 20 years off, and it always will be. It's hard to say how much we are closer today, but it seems like this is a milestone to remember. I, act, I actually remember a physics teacher in high school mentioning uh, <laughs> nuclear fusion. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Uh, and and uh, you're saying there's still a lot of work to be done. Miles O'Brien, thank you very much. You're welcome, Judy. All right, now looking at the article. <sighs> Obviously talking about <clears throat> the U.S. National Ignition Facility here in the article referencing that video that we just saw. Advances as big as this need to be rigorously checked, and that can take some time. Importantly, a series of papers detailing the experimental design, technological advancements, and results of the initial breakthrough reaction have just passed peer review. Nuclear fusion, if harnessed and scaled up, promises an abundant, inexhaustible source of clean energy without the greenhouse gas emissions of fossil fuels or the radioactive waste of nuclear fission. Fission. Fusion is the merging of two or more atoms to form a larger atom. Obviously, we have talked about that previously. In the case of this particular fusion technology, that heat, uh, I guess we'll go up before. These lab-based reactions are a far cry from commercial scale applications, mimicking the fusion reactions powering our sun and stars on a tiny scale. Without the sun's mass to provide some gravitational grunt, methods for fusing atoms on Earth rely on heat. Hence why in the video they talked not only about the the magnets and i referenced the the videos of the spinning plasma inside and then now uh, obviously with the one with the lasers they're doing this through heat because obviously you can't create gravity unless you have something with mass um, in the case of this particular fusion technology that heat is delivered via a powerful burst of light the experiments involve bombarding a capsule containing at least, oh, containing a measly 220 mi micrograms of deuterium and tritium fuel with 192 high powered lasers, which raises the pressure to 600 billion atmospheres and the temperature to 151 degrees Celsius or 272 million degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. These conditions would far exceed those inside the sun, cause the fuel to implode. The deuterium and tritium atoms fuse into helium and unleashing energy. In the breakthrough experiment of 2022, lasers fired 2.05 megajoules of energy into the fuel, resulting in a 3.15 megajoule being released, which is when we talked about this previously, um, and we actually watched the uh, video of uh, Anton Petrov. He talked about it in a lot more detail than myself. Uh, part of the thing that was originally the issue was that the amount of energy being put in was not allowing for a greater amount of energy being brought out on the back end. The new papers detail the progress that made breaking even possible. So, say, 2.05 megajoules in, 2.05 megajoules out. 
Obviously, the goal is to get more than that. Including tinkering with the fuel mix, eliminating defects in the capsule walls, increasing the mass of the pea-sized capsule, boosting laser energies, and upping the volume of fuel used. Passing that so-called ignition threshold heralded a new era of fusion research, which hasn't slowed down since. Researchers also report results from those more recent Mid-2023 generated 3.88 megajoules of energy from the same 2.05 megajoules energy inputted. Very interesting. The highest yield to date. Bear in mind, however, that huge amounts of energies are used to power the lasers in these experiments. This next part is a little interesting, and this is the current problem that we have. Like I said earlier, this is the problem with the 2022 study that came out about the fusion possibilities, right? I said it took a lot of energy to produce such a small return. So the huge amounts of energy that are used to power the lasers in the experiments is 500 trillion watts or a thousand times more power than the United States national energy grid produces at any one instant. So there's a long way to go before these fusion reactors actually generate more energy than goes into setting them off. Interesting, interesting. Commercial nuclear fusion facilities are still decades away. And we need to almost have global carbon emission. And we need to almost have, oh, have global carbon emissions in the next year to turn the climate around. Um, luckily, we have the renewable energy technologies to do that. All right. Not relevant, but go off. All right. Here is the study, and uh, you can see, actually, they they do link them all down here. I will put one, two, three, four, five of these studies in the description uh, for you to read as well. But if you look at physics.com, this is February 5th. So scientists have now vetted details of the 2022 laser power fusion reaction that produced more energy than it consumed so it's it's kind of like this it takes a lot of energy to power those lasers right now what those lasers are doing they're inputting say two megajoules of energy into this one particular thing and then boom it's so hot that fusion happens and then the result of that releases say three megajoules of energy so it's a plus one megajoule of energy if you look at that second part where we have the lasers input in, and then we have the fit fusion, and then the energy that comes out of it, you would say there's an overall increase, correct? However, part of the issue is you need 500 trillion watts of energy in order to power those lasers. So even though the energy from the lasers is only two megajoules, and that then creates, say, for example, a three megajoule nuclear fusion response. It still takes a lot of energy to power those lasers in the first place. So that's kind of the conundrum that they're in. Uh, like I said, I will put all of this down in the description. But very cool update and frankly, something I think is very interesting. Next up, what's going on in Morocco? Huh? A 90,000-year-old human footprint, multiple footprints, were found in a Moroccan beach, and they are some of the oldest and best preserved in the world. Interesting, interesting. Here's the study right here, which talks about it. Let's let's read the abstract from this first before we get into the article. 
footprints represent a relevant vestige providing direct information on the biology locomotion and behavior of the individuals who left them however the spatio-temporal distribution of hominin footprints is heterogeneous particularly in north africa where no footprint sites were known before the holocene this region is important in the evolution of hominins it notably includes the earliest known homo sapiens and the oldest and richest african middle stone age hominin sites in this fragmental iconological record we report the discovery of 85 human footprints on a late pleistocene now indurated beach surface of about 2800 meters squared at larash northwest coast of morocco the wide range of sizes of the footprints suggests that several individuals from different age groups made the tracks while moving landward and seaward across a semi-dissipative bar tro sandy beach a geological investigation and an optically stimulated luminescence dating of a rock sample extracted from the track site places this hominin footprint surface at 90.3 plus or minus 7.6 ka don't know what that means oh oh, 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 oh that's saying thousand years ago oh so it's saying it's about 90.3 give or take 7.6 thousand years ago which is the late pleistocene era the larash footprints are therefore the oldest attributed to homo sapiens in northern africa in the southern mediterranean human footprints interesting in africa Over the past two decades, a large number of hominin footprint sites have been discovered on different continents. So this is not the first one. Very, very interesting. Now let's get into the article. Two trails of ancient human footprints pressed into a beach in Morocco form one of the largest and best preserved trackways in the world. Reachers happened to find the footprint site near the northern tip of North Africa in 2022 while studying boulders at a nearby pocket beach. All right, all right. Earliest evidence for humans on the Arabian Peninsula. Let's get out of it because this is just... Uh, yeah, here we go. Analysis of the site which is the only known human trackway site of its kind in North Africa and the Southern Mediterranean, revealed two trails containing a total of 85 human footprints. The team used optically stimulated luminescence dating. Now, what is that? That is a technique that determines when specific minerals on or near an artifact were last exposed to heat or sunlight. Based on the aim based on the age of the fine grains of quartz that make up the bulk of the gently slowed beaches sand researchers determined that a multi-generational group of homo sapiens walked on the beach roughly 90,000 years ago the event took place during the late pleistocene also known as the last ice age which ended ended around 11,700 years ago according to the study Quote, we took measurements on site to determine the length and depth of the prints. Based on the foot pressure and size of the footprints, we were able to determine the approximate age of the individuals, which included children, adolescents, and adults. The researchers credit the excellent preservation of the ancient impressions to a number of factors. I mean, 90,000 years is quite some time, including the beach's layout and the long reach of the tides of the, quote, final preservation of the footprints, according to the study. Wow. I wonder what their toenails were looking like. Were they cutting them back then? I don't know. That's besides the point. The exceptional thing is the position of the beach on a rocky platform that is covered in clay sediments. 
These sediments create good conditions to preserve the tracks on the sandbar while the tides rapidly buried the beach. That's why the footprints are so well preserved here. Interesting, interesting. So technically, it does not necessarily mean that there is no possibility that a year, that there are even prints older than these 90,000-year-old ones. Now, how do they know it's 90,000 years old? Well, let's go back right up here using the op optically stimulated luminescence dating. They were able to date these. And that's a technique that determines when specific minerals on or near an artifact were last exposed to heat or sunlight. So by looking at when these things were last exposed to sunlight, and I mean, I can just click on this so we can. Oh, well, this is just a, a whole other article. All right. Maybe, maybe, maybe for another time. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Um, boop, boop, boop. However, the researchers remain uncertain about what the Ice Age group was doing on the beach. Taking a beach? Beach day? Maybe they were on vacation? I don't know. And future analysis of the site could reveal that information. But they'll have to act quickly as the ongoing collapse of the rocky shore platform could lead to its eventual demise, including of the tracks preserved on it, the team wrote in the study. We hope to learn about the total history of this group of humans and what they were doing here. Once again, I, I will put this down in the thing. This is the area right here. Very cool. I mean, why wouldn't they want to be right there? I mean, it's a great view. 90,000 years ago, I assume Northern Africa was probably relatively warm. Why wouldn't they want to just hang out? I don't know if people did that back then, but I would imagine. I feel like relaxation is something that was not invented anytime relatively soon. I feel like people for the majority of our life had like to sit down, relax a little bit. Some maybe more than others. And maybe these are that some. Very cool. So this is just all this stuff. All right, I'll, I'll put this down in the thing. Yeah, so very, very cool. I think one of the things one of the things to consider and to think about especially in 2024 about to be 2025 that and I I've thought about this more as I've gotten older and I've been um, gearing up to have children is that your existence, whether you're somebody watching this in 2024 or somebody watching this in 2050, 2060, 2100, that you and your experience is the result of people quite possibly 90,000 years ago from each step of the way, a mother and a father were able to mate and their child was able to survive, and that child was able to survive to an age where they were able to mate and have another baby, and the process continues. And that process didn't span just five, six, seven, eight generations, didn't span 10, 20 generations. We're talking hundreds of generations. If we're speaking about 90,000 years ago where there are homo sapiens that were walking around on Earth, it doesn't matter if they're in Africa. It's 90,000 years ago. If these people, our great, great, great ancestors, were able to walk around and experience life, one, how were they different from us? But two, also how lucky we are to be here each and every single person because there are so many people whether it is illness or disease 
or some kind of accident. We're talking 90,000 90, years ago. Think about 500 years ago. People getting cuts, and then it gets infected, and then unfortunately they die a couple of weeks later because they don't have antibiotics. They don't have Advil. They don't have Aleve. They don't have all this stuff, hydrogen peroxide. They don't have none of that. And that's what's taken the majority of our population. Sickness. Childbirth. Another thing that has killed many people. Where it was either the baby dying right out of the childbirth. Because they come out and there's some medical thing. Once again, we're talking, we could go back 500 years ago. We could go back 200 years ago to the 1700s. 1724. If a baby comes out and they have some kind of heart issue, are the doctors going to be able to understand and be aware of that and come up with a solution to that? No. They were still chopping legs off. They were still sawing people's legs off and amputating them. And once I think we all consider that possibility and then take that to 90,000 years ago where – Maybe one of your ancestors or my ancestors, a direct piece of our lineage, was walking on those shores in Morocco, not knowing what it would later be named at in 94,000 years ago. later after them. They weren't thinking about that. They were probably thinking about where their next meal is, how to keep their family safe, and maybe, I don't know. I don't know what else they really thought of. Probably food and family. But I think it's extremely important to be cognizant that that is the reality of life here on this planet. We are not robots. We are not some kind of software that lives forever. We are human beings that are only brought into existence by those people who gave birth to us. And that process goes back we have evidence of as far as 90,000 years ago, there were humans just like you and I, homo sapiens, walking this earth. And now does that mean that there's humans 100,000 years ago? Certainly opens the door. 150,000 years ago? Certainly opens the door. And with each year that gets added, each 1,000, 10,000 years that gets added to the age of our species – the more important it is to understand that there is a long line of people before you who helped pave the way for you and I to experience this thing called life. And unfortunately today, there are so many people who are stripped from that where they die at a young age or they die at any age really. But we have to look back and think of our generations and be – Thankful because, frankly, without them, we're not here. And I think it's important to show respect to your elders because without them, we wouldn't be here. One sperm and one egg, that's different. You're not here. The chances are either infinite or they're one of one. Interesting. <laughs>